Hey, I hope everybody's doing well this morning. And uh, hey, I, I actually got up about three o'clock, two thirty this morning. Um, just the Lord was just burdening me about a few things, and man, I was hoping that we were going to be able to um, um, have church uh, together. Man, I just I just enjoy that so much. I enjoy seeing your faces and uh, fellowshipping with each and every one of you. But um, didn't take me long getting out of my drive to realize that that was probably not going to be the case. And I got in my truck. Um, there was a lot of, you know, you know, uh, mist, uh, uh, almost like, I mean, felt like rain to me, you know, coming down this morning. And so that we were, um, I drove up to the Piggly Wiggly um, and that was far enough. And I realized very quickly that we were not going to be able to have church at the top of the hill. Um, didn't want people to, you know, risk it, and uh, so, so this is what you got today, okay? All right, um, church at my house, and uh, uh, but, uh, but we got a message for you. You can go ahead and be turning your Bible, and I encourage you to get a copy of God's Word and open it up to Philippians chapter two and verse twenty-five as we continue our series of messages. Now, I want to warn you at any time. Uh, a cat might come walking across this table, okay, all right, because we have a few cats in our house. And uh, but uh, just a couple of things I want to I want to remind you of. Um, you know, of course, you know we got this you know pretty hefty storm that's coming in tonight and uh, stumping a lot of ice and and snow and such. So um, you know we'll just be getting the word out about Wednesday services. Don't know where we're going to be. But I'm sure Gene and them will do a great job of getting, you know, the word out uh, as far as that is concerned. Uh, but because uh, this is probably something that's going to stick around for a few days, unfortunately. But uh, another thing is, is that uh, next Sunday, um, back in January, when Sammy came, we were supposed to have uh, Art Penzer with us that day for Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Art serves on the board uh, of the uh, Crisis Pregnancy Center there in Hartsville. He's a very uh, gifted man, gifted speaker, and he's going to be with us speaking next week. And just reminding us, guys, we need to be reminded uh, that, that that life is precious. And, you know, we need to be praying, especially right now in our nation. We need to be praying that abortions come to an end. And uh, because every child is in um, the image of God, and that's the reason why it should be important to us. And and so he's going to be with us, and we will take up a special offering, have the offering played out next week, so that you can give uh, to um, um, uh, to the pregnancy center. Uh, because of COVID, um, one of their biggest fundraisers was not as big, and uh, they uh, don't have the money. Um, support you know as they had last year and so I'm, I'm going to be bringing a gift if you could bring a gift as well and uh, or you can send it into the church but but man or you could just send it directly to the uh, crisis pregnancy center and uh, but man let's uh, let's be there next Sunday for art and I'm looking forward to that all right hey just want to you know uh, open up in a word of prayer uh, I know down in Trousdale County, uh, there was a deputy, Brian Emberton. I know Brian, um, he uh, 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 was involved in an accident this morning. He's okay. But that just leads me, reminds me uh, to pray. I, I'm a chaplain for the Tennessee Highway Patrol. Uh, pray for all of our first responders, you know, that have to get on the roads today. Uh, I rode with one of our troopers who's going to be on the road tonight. His name is Bo. Um, and, uh, and, and he was not looking forward to being on shift tonight because, uh, the roads are going to be really bad. And, uh, so, but they've got to be out there. And, uh, so y'all please be in prayer for all of them. And, uh, hey, let's just start in a word of prayer. And then we're going to read the word of God. And, um, and then we're going to look at this passage today. Okay. Father, thank you for the day that you've given us. I thank you for the opportunity that I have of just coming and uh, praying uh, to you and, and lifting up, um, Lord, these first responders, uh, these people that God are having to go and on the roadways, we do lift them up. We pray for them. We just ask that, God, that you would bless and watch over each and every one of you. Thank you for being with Brian uh, this morning. Pray for him as he 
uh, recovers from that. Um, God, uh, I pray for all of those who are having to go to work today, the nurses, the, the people in corrections like who I work with. Uh, God, I, I pray, Lord, that you be with each and every one of them as well. And uh, Father, bless our time today. And God, my prayer is this, uh, Lord, that the word of God would be spoken boldly here this morning and that you would accompany it with your signs and wonders, God. And, and Lord, I believe that you can change hearts. So Lord, help people to tune in, help them to tune out the, the distractions all around them. And Father, help us, Lord, to really get at the edge of our seats and ask the question, God, what might you um, have to say to us? And so, Lord, uh, please bless, and we just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Guys, we're going to read uh, verse 25 through verse 30, and this is what it says. He says, I've thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near death, but God had mercy on him and not only on him, but all on me also lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I'm more eager to send him, therefore you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Hey, uh, I don't know if you were able to watch the Super Bowl last Sunday night, but... Uh, we watched it um, here at my house, and, and uh, you know, with about five minutes left in the game, uh, all of a sudden, and they didn't really show it, but, but social media blew up about it. Uh, there was a streaker. There was a man that got out of the stands, and even though he didn't streak down all the way, thank the Lord, uh, I mean, he had like a, you know, just a, a pink-looking whatever, you know, on him, and... Uh, and, and, you know, he alluded, I, I saw some video of it, you know, uh, he alluded some of the security people and, and eventually they got him and um, they took him out and he was arrested and he had to pay a fine. And, and it makes me just want to go, why would people do that? I mean, why would anybody do that? That's nuts. That's crazy. You know, they're going to get you. You know, you're going to pay a fine. Well, come to find out. And, um, and, and, and they believe that this is true and they're still investigating it. But this guy had some friends put some money in, and, and made a bet. And the bet was that there would be a streaker at the Super Bowl. I don't know if you could bet on stuff like that, but evidently you can. That there would be a, a streaker at the Super Bowl. And, and he actually bet on himself. And, and I think uh, the bet was somewhere around $50,000. But they said that he was due to win $374,000. And, and his fine was something like $1,000, something like that. But, but, but that's the reason why he did it. Now, now he bragged a few, you know, on, on social media. He bragged to some people that he had done this. And, uh, and they have since, you know, rescinded those bets. And, you know, and, and he's probably not going to get anything for it but, but it makes you wonder i mean what would put the idea what what would give people the guts to, to go and do something silly and goofy like that well for him it was money you know it was you know maybe his you know 10 seconds of fame or whatever and uh, although i could think of a few other ways that you know that i could you know do that but you know at the same time you know it just gets me thinking you know uh, why would cause people to do things for the gospel? You know, people like Jim Elliot. Jim Elliot and his wife Elizabeth Elizabeth was uh, missionaries to Ecuador, and um, and 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 they were specifically trying to reach out to this this tribe that was known for you know just being very violent and uh, you know defending their territory. It was the way uh, the nigh tribe or i don't know if i pronounced that right but but uh they they were very passionate about reaching these people they were 
actually dropping uh, uh, things down to the village to try to soften them up. And then they decided that, that there was going to be a day that they were going to make contact. And five men um, landed a plane uh, right there on uh, a little, right there on the river side, you know, in a, kind of a beat spot. They landed the plane and, and sure enough, they, uh, they made, they reached out to these folks. Well, they, the tribe came out and they murdered them that day. And uh, they gave their lives, taking the gospel, you know, to this very violent tribe. And you, you would wonder, why would they do that? You know, uh, Jim Elliott had written in his journal earlier uh, this thought. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. You see, Jim Elliott was gripped by the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Adoniram Judson was another one of those, and he was, uh, um, in the early 1800s, he went to what is now Myanmar, uh, but was called Burma then, uh, with his wife, Anne. Um, he would see Anne eventually would pass away, um, taking the gospel to Burma. And he would lose three children in the process of taking the gospel to, to Burma. But I have actually been there. I was in uh, that country several uh, years ago. And you can still see the effects of Adonai Judson. And uh, one of the things that he did is he translated the word of God uh, into their language, into Burmese. And, and that Bible is still the Bible that they use there in that nation. And, and you wonder, why would someone do that? Why would somebody risk everything and, and, and be willing to lose everything. And once again, it was for the sake of the gospel. You know, our passage today is the story of a guy by the name of Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus risked his life to come and serve Paul there in the prison where Paul was, uh, uh, was being held. And he did it at the cost of almost his life. It, and, and Paul talks about that in the passage. Why would he do that? He would do it because, you know, going back to verse 27 of chapter 1, I mean, here's a man who is, is living his life for the sake of the gospel, living a life worthy of the gospel. And it almost seems like ever since then, since Paul said that in verse 27, that that's been his theme throughout this, living that life for the sake of the gospel. And, and, and he talked about the, God, the church coming together and being unified. He gave us this great example of Jesus Christ, the ultimate example of, of, of someone who is a servant and Jesus leaving glory and becoming a servant and giving his life and becoming a curse on the cross. And, but and then he gives these great examples at the end of chapter 2. And we looked last week at two of those men. One was being Paul, and the other one was Timothy. And now he's using Epaphroditus as an example of a man who is just captivated by the gospel. And I just want to contend that the gospel is what pushes us. The gospel is what leads us to do things that we would normally do with our lives. John MacArthur um, quoted an unknown poet who wrote this. He says, many sit at Jesus' table, but few will fast with him. When the sorrow cup of anguish trembles to the brim, few watch him with him in the garden who have sung the hymn. You know, it's so easy to sing the hymn, but man, are you there when, when, when Jesus is suffering, you know? The poet goes on and says, many will confess his wisdom but few embrace his shame. Many, while he smiles upon them loud with his praise proclaim, then if for a while he tests them, they desert his name. But the souls that love supremely let woe come or bliss, these will count their dearest heart's blood, not their own, but his. Savior, thou who hast loved me, give me love like this. So why would anyone suffer? Why would anybody die for the sake of the gospel? It's because the gospel has gripped their heart. 
the fact that Jesus Christ loves a sinner like me. You know, I'm a I'm a I'm a sinner. You know, everywhere I go, yesterday I was in Walmart. This guy goes, "Hey, big man, you know how you doing?" I, you know, I'm a big guy. I'm a big sinner. I am. You know, but why would God love someone like me and send his only begotten son to die for me? Why would Jesus die for me? You know, I'm not worthy of it at all. I haven't done anything to deserve, guys. As a matter of fact, I've, did, I've, I've done things to deserve his wrath and, and deserve the, you know, hell. But, man, he's been so good to me. He's loved me so much. He has. You know, that's the gospel. I mean, when you realize that and it just really grips your heart and it, it changes you on the inside, you know, and 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 so uh, that that's what motivates these people. That's what motivates a doctor by the name of Marth, Martha Myers. Martha Myers was a doctor and she went to a very dangerous country, um, Yemen, and uh, that was known for a lot of violence. So you hear about all these pirates and stuff that are, you know, coming off the coast of Yemen, you know, trying to board these ships, and, and and she was right there in the midst of it. And one day, a gunman come in and killed not only her, uh, but two others in that hospital. And he did it, and, and the words that he said is because he was Muslim, and he absolutely did not want uh, Christians talking about Jesus in his country, you know. You see, the reason why Martha went to Yemen is she understands, man, the, the, the gospel and, and that she was loved when she didn't deserve to be loved. She, she understands that and it, it has gripped her life. And, and, and so please don't misunderstand the passage. You know, there in that last part, we're not lifting up Epaphroditus and saying, hey, we all just need to be like him. Now, what we're doing is, is lifting up the gospel because the gospel of Jesus Christ is, is the thing that really needs to grip all of our hearts and my heart that would cause me to share that gospel with somebody else and, and love people that sometimes, you know, just need to be loved. And, 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 and that gospel needs to push me forward. Robbie Gallaty's got this. Uh, he said that when the gospel came to you, uh, it came to you because it was going to somebody else, you know, that the gospel should be, you know, we should just be vessels that once we've received it, you know, uh, I think it was David Platt, you know, says that, that all of us who've been shown grace and been given the gospel, then we owe it to the, a lost world. You know why? Because, man, we've had this great thing, undeserved, you know, that has taken place in our lives. And man, we need to share it. And, and that's why Epaphroditus is there. And that's why, you know, he's living his life and he's serving Paul and he's risked his life. And, and, and it's the, this passage, it's not that Epaphroditus was a great man. I think that he was, but he had a great gospel that he believed in. He had a great God that just uh, um, humbled him. And, and so there, there's nothing said, you know, one of the things I really like about Epaphroditus is he's just a common guy. I mean, there's there's no indication that he was even an elder at the church at Philippi. He's 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 not a statesman. He's not, you know, one of the disciples or anything like that. I mean, he's he's just an ordinary guy that is serving the Lord by serving Paul there in Philippi. And 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 so he, he's just like you and me. He's just common. Nothing special about him at all. But he's there during a time when Paul is in prison. And, and the church at Philippi knows that Paul probably has some financial needs. And they know that Paul more than likely has just some needs and some support. Somebody that can go do some things for him and serve him while he's there in that prison. And so they send Epaphroditus and they send this gift. I, I believe probably a monetary gift. They send it. To Paul and and so that uh, to to meet some needs and so Epaphroditus was the one who was was taking that money to Paul and 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 somehow or another along the lines he got very very sick Paul said he almost died you know and so Paul is thinking about sending him back and that's why we have this little section in there about him or we may never know anything about him uh, another thing that we know about him is is he's uh, 
um, named after a pagan deity, Aphrodite, you know, who was probably, uh, shows that uh, his, his, his father and mother probably were pagans, didn't believe in God, didn't believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, he was probably one of those that were radically saved there in Philippi, along with that jailer and, and, uh, and Lydia and the little slave girl that we read about in Acts 16. So, so he had this radical change in his life, and now he is serving the Lord by serving the church at Philippi, but now he is serving Paul. But there's some things in his life that I want to show you this morning that the gospel just does to us. The gospel just does to us. So let's let's look. There's three things, okay? All right? That the gospel does to us. Number one is this. Number one is the gospel unites us. The gospel unites us. We've been seeing that through the first couple of chapters anyway, haven't we? You know, but in verse 25, this is what he says. He says, I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. Now, Paul is very, very careful and um, with the words that he uses to describe Epaphroditus here. And, uh, and I think the reason is, is because, you know, Paul loves the people at Philippi. He's very thankful. He's, he's, he's very blessed by the gift that they've sent him and the very fact that Epaphroditus has gone through the trouble of coming to um, where he's at, where he wrote the, the, the letter to the church at Philippi. And he's greatly burdened by, by what's going on in this church. You know, he's heard about division in this church. Man, um, I mean, he helped birth this church. He was there when the first people believed in Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, and so he cares deeply about them. And he, he's, he's burdened for them. He, he wants things to be okay, you know? I understand that as a pastor. You want your church to be okay. You, you want them to be on mission. You want them to be all about, you know, what they're supposed to be about. And therefore, he's talked to them about being united and being serving one another and doing things without grumbling and disputing and just, just having a servant attitude like Jesus had there in chapter 2. And the reason why, the, reason, the thing that brings us all together is the gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that unites us. And, and so the gospel you know, takes people who are strangers and makes them friends. It makes them brothers and sisters in Christ. Isn't that cool? I mean, you've got brothers and sisters in Christ around the world that you don't even know, you know? But we have this one thing in common. We were all sinners and we've been saved by the grace of God, you know, through faith. And, 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 and the gospel makes us family, the family of God. You know, and, and we come together and we rally for the purpose of the gospel, you know. And so you, you even get a sense of this family unification here in this passage just by what he calls them. You know, he, he, he gives five descriptions of Epaphroditus and to underscore his character and his partnership in the gospel. And the, verse, the first three descriptions relate to his relationship with Paul and then the next to his relationship to the Philippians. But, but let's just look at those. The first thing, notice what he calls them in verse 25. He calls them my brother, my brother. You know, that, that right there describes to me our partnership in the gospel. You know, that through Christ, we have been adopted by our father. You know, Jesus has made us co-heirs with him you know, in salvation, but you have this new relationship with God and, and you have a new relationship with fellow believers, you know, to the point that they're your brothers and your sisters in Christ, you know, and, 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 and so therefore you, 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 you grow to love them. And, and, and man, once y'all were strangers and if you were in Walmart, you probably wouldn't even have talked to them. And now you see them in Walmart and, and you talk to them forever because there's a relationship there that you didn't have you know, before, and, uh, and, and so, I mean, what a blessing it is, you know, that, uh, and it's really a miracle that you have brothers and sisters in Christ 
because God has is one has made that possible. But man, when he when he describes Epaphroditus, his very first thing out of the gate he says, "You're my brother. You're my brother." You know, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. The gospel has brought us together. We're not we we're not strangers anymore. You know, I mean, and 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 I've been to some other countries and. And then when you have that same salvation and, and, and redemption, man, it doesn't take long before your love for them just grows and grows and grows. And, and uh, he was my brother. You see the love of affection there, don't, he? don't you? But the next thing he says, he says, he, he calls them a uh, fellow worker. And really the word my fellow worker you know the word mine still goes with it there you know the word fellow worker is actually used about 13 times uh, in the new testament 12 times out of the 13 is used by paul and and in each of those times he talks about people that have come alongside with him in ministry and it's really interesting because uh, from that greek word um, for fellow worker we get the word the english word synergy you know uh, synergy is a combined effort that is greater that that when you come together the effort is greater you get more accomplished together than you ever would apart and so when paul uses this phrase to describe epaphroditus my fellow worker you know he, he's saying hey look we get more done together you know we we hey we have the same goal we got the same purpose hey we're in the ship together we're rowing together and we're getting more done together. And so that's another thing the gospel does to us. The gospel gives us something to come together around. Because we've all are in this place of grace and mercy. And, and the gospel brings us together for the work of Christ and for his glory. And, and man, we want to do that. We want to get dirty for, for Jesus, you know, and do that. The third thing that he calls them in verse 25 is um, once again the word my goes with this my fellow soldier you know this reminds us that there's a battle going on and there was a fierce battle going on in the world of paul you know i mean because if you're around paul uh you were you were easily going to get hurt by uh, people and 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 because that's just the way it was there was a, a spiritual battle that was going on satan had his his target on him and was certainly going after him and and so when he looks at epaphroditus he's more than just a brother he's more than just a co-worker a fellow worker man he is a soldier a fellow soldier john MacArthur did a little study of this this uh phrase fellow soldier and, and what he found out is uh, that, that outside of the biblical word, that this was used only on special occasions. And usually it was used by a general or someone in great authority uh, to honor another soldier, you know, because basically he was putting that soldier, you know, he may have been the lowest of the low, but, but, but by calling him my fellow soldier, he was putting him on the same wavelength is him and and it was almost like saying my fellow commander-in-chief or my fellow general it, it was a it was a position of great honor um it was you know at that point they were not looking down on that soldier they were bringing that soldier up to their level and so to say that you're a fellow soldier you know was to say that you you had rank a rank of honor that um the word as a matter of fact the greek word there is uh Stratios is where we get the word strategist, you know, um, you, it's almost like he's saying you're a great strategist, you're, you're, you're a great soldier person, and, and I'm lifting you up, and I'm putting you on the same level as me. I mean, that's, and, and when you, when you put that along the side of that, he's my brother, and he's my fellow laborer, and now he's, he's my fellow soldier. Man, they're in the battle together. You know, and, and when, when Paul is hurt, he's hurt. When Paul, you know, goes through stuff, he's going through stuff. And, man, isn't that the way it is? 
You see, the gospel does that to us. The gospel brings us together. We're in this war together. We're meant to be encouragers of one another, guys. We're meant to lift one another up, man. We're meant to never look down on another person. They're my fellow soldier. They're in this battle with me. Man, therefore, I'm praying for them. And they're, they're going through stuff. I'm going through stuff, you know? And, and I, we're, we're battling together. Man, we're... Too, too often we battle each other in church, man. That's not the way church is supposed to be, is it? Not at all. Man, we need to be there for one another. Lift each other up. Lock arms with them for the sake of the gospel. You're my fellow soldier, people that are listening to me right now. You're my fellow soldier. You're my brothers and sisters. Man, you're my fellow laborers. We're working together for the same thing. You know, the next two phrases that he uses in verse 25, it's, he's kind of taking the picture off of himself, and now he's, he's, he's putting it onto um, the, the church there at Philippi. He, and he says there at the end, uh, and your messenger and minister to my need. With two words, he explained what Epaphroditus was called to do. And this is really cool, okay? Um, the, the, the word for messenger is, is the Greek word is apostle on and, and uh, um, like the apostle Paul, he is one sent with a mission. Okay. And, and Epaphroditus was sent by the church at Philippi with the mission of showing the, the love that they had for Paul. They wanted to know Paul, know that he was supported and they had a gift, of course. You know, and so he was a messenger. The second thing is he was called to be a minister, okay? And, um, and the word for minister there, the Greek word, is the word that we would get the word liturgy from, okay? All right? And it carries the idea of priestly service in uh, the Greek version of the Old Testament. It's the same word that would be used for a priest. And, and so, I mean, this is, this is really cool because... Because, you see, Paul, um, or, or Epaphroditus, rather, was a minister. He was a, he was a priest, uh, you know, and, and, and that he was there. And his, his act of worship was in serving Paul. You know, we're, the Bible says that we're all priests, you know, that, that, the priesthood of the believer, you know, and, 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 and that we are God's priest and, and we're called to worship him. But one of the ways that we worship him is by serving other people. You know, Epaphroditus served Paul. But, 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 but through serving Paul and, and the sake of the gospel, he was acting almost like in the role of a priest doing something holy. And so are we. You see, the gospel does that, you know. It takes casual service and it makes it sacred service for the king, it's, it's not casual. It's not mundane. What you do on Wednesday night and on Sundays, man, and, and during the week as you serve people for the sake of, of Jesus, man, it's an act of worship. You're showing his worth, that, that God is worthy of all of these things. And so, so you have these five descriptions of Epaphroditus. One commentator wrote this, he says, wouldn't these five terms be wonderful on a tombstone? Wouldn't you like to be known as a brother or sister or co-worker, fellow soldier, a messenger, and a minister? Man, if, if we could sum up your life and put it on your tombstone, what would, it, what would it say, you know? You see, the gospel changes us completely. Man, it just does. It changes our relationships and how we see one another and I mean, it just unites us. It's supposed to unite us, but so often we don't. We let stuff get in the way. The second thing that the gospel does, it just undoes us. Just undoes us. You know, uh, Philip in verse 25 and 229, he said, I, I thought it necessary to send to you, Epaphroditus, my brother and, and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and you messenger and minister to my need. He, you know, for, for he's been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. 
Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. So after all this commendation, verse 25, and, and actually before it, he says, I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Why, why is he sending them back? Why is he wanting to send them back, you know? I mean, if he's as valuable as your co-laborer and soldier and things, I mean, why not just keep them there, you know? And 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 somebody says, well, you know, well, maybe he was unfaithful. No, there's there's no proof that we have that Epaphroditus was unfaithful in any way or or, or he was homesick. And no, that's not what we see or he misses his family. We, we don't see that, you know, but why is it necessary for Paul to send back? And in and, and verse 26, it says, because he was longing for you. Oh, there, he's on set. But you got to read further in that verse. And the reason why, why he's longing for them is because he has heard that they have heard that he was sick. You know, somehow or another, the message had gotten back to, to the church at Philippi that he was sick and and therefore, he's longing for them. He's, he's pining away. He is distressed. By the way, the word that is used there, you know, distressed, you know, that uh, he's, in, he's got a lot of turmoil going on. It's, it's affecting him physically. And he's thinking a lot. And, and why is that? And the reason why he is is because he's, he cares about what they th care about. He hurts what they're hurting about. The same word there is the same word that, that is used of Jesus in Matthew 26, 38, where it says, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. I mean, I mean, the Pamphrodotus understand this. He is in great distress, but he is in distress because they are in distress. He is troubled because they are troubled. You know, I mean, and, and he believes that they're worrying about him. They know the love that they have for him. And, and, and Paul says, you know what? I've got to send you because he's not, he can't continue existing, you know, knowing that you don't know that he's, he's okay. And, and so, uh, you know, Paul could have went, you know, hey, Paphroditus, you got to suck it up, buttercup. You know, you got to, you know, Pick it up and 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 and, and continue on, and, and just the fact that Epaphroditus feels bad, you know, he, he could have said to Epaphroditus, "Look, man, you need to, to to get right and 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 go on," but he doesn't do that. Why? Because Paul loves the Philippian church too. Paul loves the Philippian church. He loves Epaphroditus, and and so he's like, you know what? Epaphroditus is valuable to me, but I, I think I'm probably going to send them back, you know, because he's not feeling good because you're not feeling good. And, and, and a matter of fact, in verse 27, indeed, he was ill near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon my sorrow. And Paul tells them, you know, hey, look, man, he was sick. He was sick near death, and if it wasn't for God's mercy, he would have died. And he says, man, I'm so glad that that didn't happen because I would have had sorrow upon sorrow. Why? Because, see, Paul knows, man, he loves Epaphroditus, but Paul also knows that the church at Philippi loves Epaphroditus too. And it would have just brought sorrow into his life if something had happened to Epaphroditus. You see, here's a man that is deeply loved. Here's a church that is deeply loved. And, and why in the world would make people love each other like that? The gospel. You see it? See, the gospel just kind of undoes us. You know, where where our tendency would be selfish, man, the, the gospel makes you unselfish. Where your tendency is to think about, you know, your plans and your time and your money and and, and things of that nature, the gospel and what God does in your heart and your life gets you thinking about other people and, and you love them and you hurt when they hurt and, and, and you're in anguish and you're in pain if they're 
and, and pain and and, and and listen, these people were once strangers to you, and then all of a sudden, you know, people that would have irritated us don't irritate us quite so much. Or when they do, we forgive them, and we love them, and we continue on with them. You see, the gospel is supposed to undo us like that. Isn't that what Paul had been talking about up in that other, you know, the beginning of chapter 2, when he said, hey, look, man, I need y'all to be on the same page. I need you to put your others in front of yourself and... And, and don't do anything through vain conceit, you know, and, and serve one another and put others in front of yourself. And man, that's what the gospel is supposed to do to us. In verse 28, he says, man, I'm more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. See, he's anxious because he believes that they're anxious, you know. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. And so Paul tells them, you know, because see, when they see Epaphroditus come back, you know, I mean, he's not dead. They're going to rejoice over that. But their very, very next question is going to be, why did you leave Paul? You know, we sent you to serve him. We sent you to be there with him during this time until he got out of prison or until he died. One or the other. Why are you here? And Paul wants to make sure that they honor. Paul wants to make sure that they they give Epaphroditus his due because, man, he had just had a brush of death and he was willing to die for the sake of, of doing what they wanted him to do. Do you know something? Paul's not concerned about himself. He's willing to let him go back. Paphroditus is not concerned about himself. Why is that? Because the gospel just undoes us. It does. It just undoes us. You know, it... Uh, I mean, you just you just see that there's this deep humility, and you don't see Paul complaining, and, and you don't see Epaphroditus complaining. You know, the gospel just just undoes us. There, there's just that working out of salvation that you see that that he was calling them to early up in the chapter. That's what the gospel does. Makes you love people. Makes you hurt for them. Yeah. Man, you're hurting for people. I hope that you are, you know. I mean, there's a lot of people hurting and lonely. And, and we talked about that last week. And they're in isolation. And, man, we should care about them. Why? Because God has treated you better than you deserve to be treated. And I deserve to be treated. You know, and out of that, we, we love other people. The gospel just it unites us. The gospel just undoes us. But, guys... Notice very quickly is the gospel just unties us. It just unties us from this world. You know, he tells him in verse 29, so receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men for he nearly died for this, the work of Christ, risking his life to complete that was lacking in your service to me. You know, it, it could be the fact that he had been sick. And there are a lot of commentators that believe that he was sick because, man, just the spiritual warfare, the the tension, all the things that were going on there in Philippi. I mean, really, really could have gotten to him to the point of just deathly illness, and and uh, don't don't really know. But but make, make no bones about it. Paphroditus had put himself at great risk just coming and being with Paul. You know, he was literally risking his life by helping Paul. Paul was a hated man. The Romans hated him. Um, hey, the religious leaders hated him. The ungodly society around him hated him. And and he was forever being persecuted. Matter of fact, he described his ministry in 2 Corinthians 12, 10. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses. It's the same word, by the way, of sickness that we see in Epaphroditus. Same, same word is used there. And with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities for when i am weak then i'm strong so what kind of stuff when you comes up when you serve the lord well man it's persecutions and it's difficulties and uh, of course he says when i'm weak i'm strong in in the lord and and that very well may have been what made epaphroditus but make no bones about it hey um epaphroditus was not tied to this world he was willing to die for the sake of the gospel. 
he was willing to make himself vulnerable. He was willing to let go of the things of this world. This world was not his home. Man, he was just a passing through. You know, and, and he was willing to die. And Paul noted that. He, hey, he was bold. He was courageous, loyal, faithful. I love that statement, risking his life. You know, it's an interesting verb there. Risking his life. It, it's a, a verb that is connected to uh, the noun uh, parabola, which, which means dice. Um, the verb form means to roll the dice. and uh, You know, uh, it means to gamble. Uh, Epaphroditus was a gambler. He gambled with his life for the sake of the gospel, for Jesus Christ, you know? It, it means to expose yourself to danger, you know? And, and, and that's what he did. Not, not just to disease, just by being faithful and being around Paul, he exposed himself to danger and he was willing to die for Jesus. And that's why a lot of expositors and theologians through the years have called Epaphroditus the loving gambler, that his love for Jesus and his love for Paul made him gamble his life, his well-being, his health, everything. You know, he, he, he loved the church at Philippi. He loved Paul. He loved Jesus more than he loved himself. Therefore, he would gamble. He would take risk. He gave his life away. You know, there's been some groups through the years. As a matter of fact, in the days of the early church, right after the New Testament was written, there was an association of men and women who got together who called themselves the gamblers. The gamblers. And that their hero was Epaphroditus. And, 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 and their aim and their mission was to visit prisoners and to visit the sick, and especially those with infectious, dangerous communicable diseases they would go where no other people would go they were the gamblers and they did it for jesus and they wanted to make sure jesus was known history talks about them in uh, a.d 252 in the city of carthage a terrible plague uh, came and hit that city and the heathen people of that city were so afraid of the germs that uh they would just literally, they'd even take time to bury the bodies. They would just cast them out of the city and not even bury them, you know. They would just throw their bodies outside of the city limits and uh, not wanting to touch them for burial. Well, the story is, is that uh, Siperian, the Christian bishop, gathered the both congregation and the believing church together. And it was the Christians that would go out and bury the bodies. And it was the Christians that would minister to the plague um, um, affected people of the city and they would bring them food and they would nourish them back to health. It was the Christians that did it. They were the gamblers. Why, why can't we do that? Because the gospel unties us from this world. You know, death doesn't scare us because we've got eternal life. It's like Paul said in chapter 1, you know, for me to die, you know, is gain. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Don't threaten me with death because it's gain to me. If you're going to kill me, kill me because I'm going to be with Jesus. You know, the gospel just unties us from this world. Hey, we, we, don't, we don't need the things of this world. We don't need the pleasures of this world. We don't need the accolades of this world, the pats on the back from this world. You know, man, we don't need that today because we're not of this world anymore. We're of another kingdom, another city. You know, I like uh, Bill Cook, who was a good friend of uh, Harold and who recently just passed away. And and a matter of fact, we sent a gift as a church to help bury Bill Cook and Bill Cook used to liken himself to people who would strap themselves with a bomb for their cause and go out and blow out a bunch of people. He would, he, Bill Cook used to say, you know, may we strap ourselves with the bonds of love and take the gospel. Bill Cook, man, wanted to know how to get to Afghanistan and Iran. I remember him saying that. He used to tell us to pray, you know, don't pray for my safety, pray for my success. 
Why would anybody do that? It's because Bill Cook understood the gospel. Do you? Do you understand the gospel? Man, has the gospel gripped your heart and life? I think it's strange, this last point, the gamblers. You know, we got this pandemic going on. And, and we've been kind of waiting and, and we put off ministry and we put off doing some things because you know what? We don't want it to spread. I get that. I understand that. You know, you know, we don't want to get a Hey, I had COVID. Don't want to ever get that again. You know, when, uh, today Candy, my wife is going to go get the first step of the virus, you know, uh, the vaccine, not the virus, but the vaccine, you know, she had it. Don't want her to get it again. Awful disease. But man, are, are are we willing to put our safety on the line for the sake of the gospel? I mean, that's what Epaphroditus did. That's what the gamblers did. You know, so many times we let fear keep us back from from doing what needs to be done. See, see, I understand people say, well, we just need to wait, we need to hold off. But in the in the meantime, people are dying and going to hell that need to be introduced to Jesus. Man, if there ever was a time that people were gamblers for the sake of Christ, it's now. Come, come, hey, come be a co-laborer with, with Gene and Rachel on, on Wednesday night. Come be a co-laborer, co-soldier. Come be my brother, my friend, you know, and, and let's, let's do this together. Let's don't be, let's believe that God is sovereign. Man, let's pray. Hey, hey, let's do things as if it all depends on us and pray if it all depends on God. And man, just trust his sovereignty, trust his power, trust that he's able to protect us. And man, the very worst thing that happens is I die. And if I die, man, I go to be with Jesus. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. So what are you risking your life for? What are you laying down your life today for? You know? We lay down our lives because we believe that Jesus is big enough to pick me back up. So does the gospel grip you like that? Here, here's my so what questions, and then we'll pray and we'll be done. You know, has the gospel changed you at all? If it hasn't changed you, I mean, have you really, do you know the gospel? I, I mean, understand, you, you might want to revisit the gospel in your life, you know? I mean, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ came to die for sinners like you and me who didn't deserve it. Is, is it changing you? You know, why are you risking your life for? What are you laying down your life for? You know, what is the gospel? Does it get you to do stuff? I mean, honestly, the gospel should be a motivating factor in our life. Number two, has the gospel changed how you view fellow believers, especially those in your church family? Do you hurt when they hurt? Do you pray for them? Do, do you, are you bothered by the things that bother them? That's what brothers and sisters should be about, you know? That's what, and I'm sorry if I haven't been about that for you. And I need to do better. You know, do, do you see them as brothers and sisters? Do you see them as your co-laborers, my, your fellow soldiers? Do you feel like that you're in the fight? Or are you letting other people fight and you're sitting back on the sidelines? They always say to people that there's like three types of people at a football game, you know? There are those who watch things happen, you know? There are those on the field making things happen. And, and then there are those on the sidelines asking the question, what happened? Man, be in the field. Be, be in the, just right in the middle of it all. Do you see your service, whether at church or with others? Man, do you see it as worship? Do you see what you do on Wednesday night, guys, as worship to Jesus? Do you see driving, you know, you know uh, that, uh, that, that van, this worshiping Jesus, picking up somebody on side, worshiping Jesus? You know, it, it's service, it's your minister. You know, do you take it with that seriousness? Number four, how has the gospel affected how you love others? Do you grieve when others grieve? Do you weep when others weep? 
And then five, has the gospel untied you from this world? Do you just play it safe when it comes to serving Jesus? Or, or, or are you cutting ties from this world? And, and then six, and just listen to my heart. Man, I love you. You know, um, how has the pandemic affected your service for the Lord? Hmm? It's affected mine, I'll be honest with you. You know, people are still dying and entering eternity without Jesus. Man, what are we waiting for? Man, it needs to be us, the church that rises to the top and ministers. Believe, if we got to act like we believe the Word of God is the Word of God and that God is sovereign and big enough and, and, and man, we, we need to go on and we don't need to be sitting on the sidelines. I love you, man. If you've been sitting on the sidelines, get back in the game, guys. It's time for us I, to, to, to go forward for the glory of God. Listen, I, I appreciate you um, listening in. I know I'm not the, the shortest preacher in all the world, but man, isn't that such a good scripture? I just love it, man. I just love to dig in it. And uh, I can't help myself. You know, when I start studying it, and man, all these things start appearing, and and uh, and I just, it's things that I need to hear. Hey, y'all be safe. If y'all need us elders, understand that we're there for you, okay? Um, it's your... If you got needs, you know, with all this ice and snow coming in, hey, let us know. Let us come serve you. It's worship to us, okay? All right? You know, let's be brothers and sisters. Hey, if you need milk and bread, I got it, people. I got I got eggs, too. Yesterday, we made French toast, you know? All right? But if you need us, we're in this together. Man, I love you. I want to pray for you. And um, and and, and let's, let's pray. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us. And uh, God, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for ministering to my own heart. Uh, Lord, I pray that the gospel would have a great effect on me. God, thank you for saving me. Thank you, God, for coming into my life and giving me a new heart in life. And thank you, Father, for the fact that there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Now, Lord, help us as we go through this day. Uh, Lord, be with me and Candy, and God, as we uh, go to get her vaccine this afternoon, God. Uh, Lord, be with our church family. Be with our first responders again, God. Lord, uh, be with those who've been sick, and uh, Lord, bring them back, God. I just my heart, I love Paul and Lydia, God. And Lord, please um, help them and be with them. And, and uh, God, I don't know if the Bowers are back yet, but Lord, be with them as they travel back in. And uh, God, just uh, watch over our church family, each and every one. This Jamie, Lord, bless her. Keep her, Father God. Be with our nurses, you know, Shondell and, and uh, Lenore and and just, Lord, all of them, you know, that are out there just fighting the fight, Lord, and, and every day, uh, God, being Jesus to people, Lord. Be with them, and Lord, help us to continue to be your church. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. And uh, I'm going to hit in live video. God bless you. Bye.